So I want to welcome you to, uh, to the new series that we're, we're beginning, our message series called Risen. Um, I'm praying that God is going to use this series to shed some light um, on us and actually to light some fires that will never go out. I want him to light some fires that will never go out in your heart, in your homes, and in this church, beyond even, in the community. Ray Johnson, uh, one of the folks that prepared this series, um, tells a story about Scott and Leslie who were married and they left on their honeymoon and they arrived at the early hours of the morning at this fancy hotel. They were excited and they're looking forward to spending their first night together in a lux luxurious bed in the bridal suite of a luxurious hotel. And when they got to the room, all they found was a sofa, a table, and a chair but no bed. After several minutes, they discovered that the sofa was a fold-out bed. They spent a fitful night on an uncomfortable fold-out bed, turning and tossing on a lumpy mattress with saggy spring. And when the honeymoon night was ruined, Scott stormed down to the front desk the next morning, and he gave the clerk a piece of his mind about the service that they had received. He said, there must be some mistakes in the clerk. And after looking at the reservation, he said, did you open the door to the bedroom? <laughs> Scott went back up to the bedroom, opened the door that he thought led into a closet. And he discovered that there was a bedroom and there was a bridal suite. Inside was a king-size bed. There was a fruit basket on the stand, a box of chocolates, a dozen red roses, all of them completely <coughs> available. And yet, unused. This series is an invitation for us to open the door to the implications of the cross in your life, the resurrection and the power that it could bring to your life. Those early Christians, Jesus' disciples, spent that first Easter morning locked behind doors. They huddled together in fear, fearing for their lives. They're saying just as they they, these people killed Jesus, they're going to kill us too. They walked into that room defeated. But when they walked out, they walked out dynamic. They walked into that room and they were crushed. But you know what? They walked out confident. They walked into that room having a pity party and they walked out ready to take on the world. They walked into that room paralyzed by fear and they walked out filled with pain. Something happened in that room. Something happened. What happened? That's what this series is about. Join us for the next four weeks and you can experience the same kind of transformation that those disciples went through on that first Easter. America right now is fixated on all the events that um, are going through going on in the Middle East, and of course everybody's fixated on the election right now. But 2,000 years ago, six events took place in the lives of the people that changed the world permanently. And they were focused on those six events. Those six events have changed everything. Everything. Life will never ever be the same. The six events are this. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. He was forsaken by his friends, denied by his followers, tried by his accusers, tortured under Roman guards, crucified by his enemies. Why did God allow those six events to happen? Huh? Why? Why did Jesus have to go through all that suffering? Why was he subjected to that grueling, gruesome, brutal, horrendous death? Couldn't there be another way? There's a new movie that's out, Risen. I encourage you to see it. And it's going to allow millions of people to actually see the gospel. They will see what happened. Today, I want to talk to you about why it happened. We're going to take a look at the two most important questions in life. One is what really happened on the cross. And two, if we get that, if we get what really happened on the cross, then what does that mean? How does it change our lives? 
One of the best known scriptures in the Bible is what? John Bible. 316. 316. Let's take a look at that in the verse right after. <coughs> it's in your Bible. It's under the Gospel of John. Chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. Really easy for those of you who may not know what it is. We just take it for granted. Everybody knows that because you see it held up in football games. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it but to save the world through him. That is Christianity in a nutshell. That's the good news. What does good news mean? Huh? What is good news? The gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Gospel means good news. Good news is the gospel. Is that right? Hello? So what really happens when people encounter the group the, the cross of Jesus Christ? Have you encountered the cross? Have you thought about it? Find out. Let's look at three people who were there at the cross. We can learn about them in John 19, 25 to 27. You don't have to turn to that, but it'd be nice if you did. Um, because there we find out it says that near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple who he loved standing by her, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. One of the first things we realize about the cross, when we look at who was there, is that we find out it's a place of redemption. It's a place of redemption. I want, to, I want you to look at a clip from the movie. Instinct. Yes, she was death, but there, beside his mother, was she also born with you in his tomb? If you knew what happened there. Oh, can I stop this? Enlighten me then. It's beyond us. Don't spare me the riddles and sound of battle. Where did you take the issue? He's right here. Is he a goblin? A sprite? A light against someone? Open your heart and see. Was it delusion? To keep crusade alive? I can have what I want. Move from here to the death like that. And it doesn't matter. Ah. A martyr. No. Then give me the others and I'll grant you freedom. I'm not ready for you. Show me another side. Receive redemption. Huh? Are you the most unlikely 
Or better yet, raise your hand if you think the person next to you is the most important. <laughs> chapter 8 in verse 2 it says we read that Mary Magdalene was a woman from whom Jesus had cast out demons. These demons, the devil got a hold of her life. He was wreaking havoc on her life. They made her do terrible things. She was in bondage for a long time. Satan was at work in her life. He was destroying her emotionally and spiritually. We could call her a woman from the streets. She was a prostitute. Here she is at the foot of the cross. She was hopeless and helpless. Her situation was hopeless and helpless. But Jesus delivered her. He set her free. Think of how the Apostle Paul describes the work of Christ. He says, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You see what the cross is? It's a place where you exchange. It's a place of exchange. Darkness for light. Unfathomable changes take place when you go to the cross. You go from darkness to light. You discover the power of God as it begins to take control in your life. And you know, you move from weakness to power. You realize what you heard. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And that brings you from darkness to light. And you move from guilt to grace. And you understand what the grace is, that is happening on that cross. You exchange your past failures for future hope. That's what Jesus did for Mary Magdalene. That's what he can do for you. But I want to tell you something. This is where we forget. We get busy in our lives and me, me, me. And what's going on in our needs? Redemption. Redemption is awesome. It's wonderful. But it is costly for me to receive forgiveness. Jesus had to be made sin for me and die in my place. I can imagine just that picture on our window up there is the Garden of Gethsemane. And I can imagine the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus there on his knees, confused, unsure, praying for me, for me, for you. And I imagine him saying, God, is there any way that this person could get into heaven except for me to die on the cross for all of the sins and pay for his sins for him? Is there any other way, God? And God says, no, son. You know there's no other way. You know that no sin can enter into heaven. Somebody has to pay for that man's sins. Jesus went through all that trial, all that suffering, all that scourging, and then they nailed him to the cross. By going to the cross, Jesus said, okay, Father, you said if I took all the judgment for this one man's sin, that he could go to heaven. So, all right, Father, let the judgment fall. And in that moment of agony, Jesus cried out from the cross, for me, for you, it is finished. And then the skies turned dark, and for three and a half hours there was silence in heaven. At that time, Jesus took on the sin of the world. That is love. That's love to the first degree. When they drove those nails through the hands of Jesus, they went straight into the heart of God. The cross is a place of redemption. And it's also a place of relationship. And I've come to believe this one simple truth. Life is about relationships, and the quality of our lives depends on the quality of our relationships. When we forget or lose sight of that, we start to live a half-life, and we start drowning in our doing instead of growing in our being. Jesus taught us again and again that the essence of being fully alive is being fully open and being fully present to one another. You ever been with somebody and felt all alone? Being open.
open and present to one another. We may accomplish a lot of things in our lives, but I truly believe we will be remembered for who and how we love. That's what we'll be remembered for. How are you doing on that front? Is that what you'll be remembered for? Ray Johnston shares another story I want to share with you here. A few years back, he got a call from Forbes magazine, and they asked him if they could do an interview. He was surprised, and he said, you are a magazine for millionaires. I think you've got the wrong Ray Johnston. And they replied, they want to do an interview on the CEOs of the largest corporations and see what they can learn from pastors of large churches. So he said, game on. He's a pastor of a very large church. We had a fascinating three-hour conversation, he remembers. And their last question was the best question. They asked, what is the most important thing you have learned in the last 10 years? And I replied, oh, that's easy. Here it is, he says. Listen, the solution to everything is the right person. I explained that in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel prospered when the, with the right leader, and they declined under the wrong leader. And I also said, by the way, that is also the central message of the Bible. The solution to everything is not the right religion. It is not the right rituals. The solution to everything is a relationship with the right person. And Christians believe that that person is Jesus Christ. Where is that relationship found? What makes that relationship possible? Mary, the mother of Jesus, she is there at the cross. And she discovered that relationship at the cross. Because the cross is a place of relationship. Mary suffered. Think about it. She suffered because of how her son Jesus died. He's hung on a cross. Capital punishment. A death that's inflicted on common thieves. And Mary suffered because where he died. He was out in the open, in a public place, stripped of bear, shamefully exposed, exposed for all to see, tortured and beaten. And as Mary stood there, she felt the pain of that sword going through her soul. John 19, 26 and 27 says, When Jesus saw his mother standing there and the disciple who he loved standing nearby, he said, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple he said, here is your mother. What is Jesus saying to us when he says that to his mother and to John? What is he saying to us? That we are now in a relationship with him. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are members of God's household. Ephesians 2.19. That means because of the cross, you belong in God's household along with every other Christian. Christian, not Methodist, Baptist, whatever. Christian. We are in the same household. It takes every one of us to make God's household complete, the kingdom of God. For we all have different work to do. So we belong to each other, and we all need each other, right? In his letter to the Romans, Paul says this in 12, 4 and 5. He reminds us, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all others. That's the message of the cross. Because of the cross, we're all part of one body, Christ's body now. The cross is a place of relationship. But even more, we see through another one at that cross, the beloved disciple, there with his rabbi hanging on the cross. That we see the cross as a place of responsibility. Jesus restored John, but just as he wants to restore all of us, he didn't stop there. He didn't stop there. At the cross, he also gave John some responsibility. He gave him a charge. Look, he says in John 19 again, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her 
into his home. Jesus was saying that John was going to take Jesus' place in Mary's life and in the community. He would no longer be on earth to watch over his mother, so John was going to assume this role. He was saying, go, take my mother and be a son to her. For John, the cross is a huge place of huge responsibility. And John accepted it. He accepted it. What does it say? He says, from that time on, he took her into his home. The cross required responsibility from a whole lot of other people, too, that we don't even think about. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was just passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Taken together, can you see what the message is? Huh? All believers, all believers are to take Christ's place here on earth. When he rose from the dead, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. You. You and I are to represent Jesus Christ to others. That's responsibility. To acknowledge the cross is to acknowledge that we have a place of responsibility and we don't do it. So what happens when we really get the message of the cross? When we really get the message of the cross, we have a new confidence toward God. We become confident because we trust in God. We believe in God's love. We believe in His grace and His power. We actually believe in it. So we experience it. I want you to, to look at the, the love and the power as we're closing down here, but I got another clip here as we think about his love. We discover the value and the cross of his love. Who's not following you? I am he. Would you like to wait? By spreading fast. By my own eyes, Drew. I, I, I walked with him. He spoke to me. It's unbelievable, but it is so. And can't you really look? Right now. What's we'll wrong with the body? He must have shed that snake skin. God is not a lie back and call. God, Yahweh manifests himself through a crazy, poor, dead Jew. <laughs> Well, so it appears. And what does this rebirth mean? Eternal life. For, for, for everyone. Everyone who believes. I was recruiting to him. Much better than salt. And the aim. Well, we are few for now. And our only weapon is love. And our only weapon is love. That's powerful, huh? When we really get the message of the cross, we become confident in God's love. I want you to hear this. We love because He first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. We love because He first loved us. He loved us and expects us to do that. That's the love of Jesus Christ. Many thought that the grace of Jesus Christ was a lie. But when we really get the message of the cross, we become confident in His grace, too. His love, His grace. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet He did not sin. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That means that we can live free from guilt when we approach the throne of grace with confidence. Confidence. Guilt is a killer. Guilt puts us in a place of punishment where we beat ourselves up. Guilt puts us in a place of paralysis where we're locked in all these prisons from the past. Guilt, guilt will rob you of your joy. It'll take your energy, it'll take your confidence, and eventually it will take your faith. 
Guilt has power in your life. Look at what Scripture says. 2 Corinthians 5.19 and 21 in the message. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everybody what he is doing. How you ask? In Christ, God put the wrong on him, who never did anything wrong, and sin was not even in him, so that we could be put right with God. God wants you to be right with him. Do you want that? Do you want to be? He does too. That's what God wants. God wants everyone to know about the cross. Not to make them feel guilty, but to free them from guilt. You talk about the cross and people feel guilt and shame automatically. It's been pounded into them. It's not about that. Free from guilt. But when you really get the message of the cross, you can become confident in God's power. Notice what happened after the resurrection. Acts 1-3. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Notice, that wasn't just a one-time deal. Surprise, here I am. And then Jesus was never seen again. It wasn't like, here I am. That could have been a vision. People could have thought that was a dream. It could have been a many people in their deep grief just trying to muster up an illusion of hope to see Jesus again. But instead, we learned that there were, we heard it there, many convincing proofs that he was alive. Scripture says for 40 days Jesus continued to appear to the apostles and tell them about the kingdom of God. 40 days. 40 days he was alive after the crucifixion on earth in that community. For 40 days he's walking the streets of Jerusalem. All kinds of people saw him. About as many believers became, people became believers as a result. Architects and historians tell us Jerusalem's population was about a quarter of a million people at the time. Within 20 years of the resurrection, within 20 years, in the city of Jerusalem, there were between 100 and 125,000 believers. That's half the city becoming believers. Why? Because so many people had seen him. And they were convinced about the amazing miracle of his resurrection and salvation for all. Jesus is the real deal. Okay? If you're doubting, if you're not sure, if you're questioning, it's true. He's a, this doesn't happen by, by accident, okay? Can you imagine walking down the street and a grand, friend grabs your arm and says, hey, isn't that the guy that the Romans killed on the cross? Isn't that the guy who said he was God? Maybe he is. He must be. Huh? What about... What would it be like to be one of those religious leaders that just put him to death? Hey, uh, you know that guy that we crucified? He's back. <laughs> That's the power of the cross. That is the power of the cross. It's the kind of confidence that we're filled with because of the cross. When we really get the message of the cross, we become filled and convinced of the power and then we get it replaced with a new fear and it is a fear towards sin that you saw today. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just dump something over our head and be cleansed from sin like we saw the children? You know what's the matter? The world no longer fears sin. No longer. The world fears other things. Jesus did not fear what the world fears. We ought to hate sin. Why? Because it separates us from God. Sin put Jesus on the cross. Sin put Jesus on the cross. It's not a laughing matter. Sin is not a laughing matter. How serious is it? 
Take a look at the cross. Take a look. That's how serious it is. Just look. It's a serious matter. So we should hate sin and do everything we can to fight against it and against injustice in the world. Jesus said in John 17, 14 and 15, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world anymore. Any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. We should fight sin of every kind, large and small in our lives. It separates us from God and from eternal life and the joy that God has for us. The individual greatest need of our time, right now, I truly believe, and you must think about it, is integrity. Integrity. After all, Romans 6 reminds us that our old life died with Christ on the cross so that our sinful selves would know, have no power over us and we would not be slaves to sin. The attitude of God in Scripture is always that any sin is deadly serious. Look around you today. Sin has all but destroyed the world that could have been. The world that could have been. Pride. All those sins. When we really get the message of the cross, you know what happens? We get a new compassion for people. And I'm not talking about just going and serving people. We ought to love Christ to hate sin, and we ought to love others enough to tell the Apostle Paul wrote, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. If somebody died for you, would you want to know about it? If someone died for your next door neighbor, your mom or your dad, or your best friend, the people that you work with, or people at school, don't you think that they deserve to know about it? That's why we do Christian ministry. That's why we have churches. That's why we educate these children. That's why we minister to the community. This is why we share our story. It's so we can reach more people for Jesus. You know right now, the average person in this community is sitting home right now. Perhaps they're reading the newspaper online, sleeping in, watching television, or maybe complaining on Facebook. And they are totally, totally oblivious to what Jesus Christ has done for them and how much he loves them. They're totally oblivious. If your friend lives his or her entire life without knowing Jesus Christ, and dies without knowing Jesus, then the death of Jesus is what? It's wasted, meaningless, worthless. You are never going to have a better opportunity than right now to tell somebody about Christ. And because of this movie, we can see his story in real life. Don't waste this opportunity. Call up a friend, a neighbor, somebody who's not sure who's seeking. Take them to the movie. Take them and buy them dinner. And then you get the opportunity, tell them what Jesus has done in your life. If you will get your heart ready, God will open the door for the opportunity for you to share about Jesus in your life and to share with people who really, really need it. I pray this week that that opportunity becomes real for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your sacrifice and for loving us so much. Help us to take the message of the cross seriously, to take time to learn it. Not just learn it, Lord, but live it. To take serious our responsibility for the blessing of redemption, Lord, that others may be redeemed. We thank you for this precious gift, and we pray that you will use this series to your glory, Lord, to bring others to know you and to know eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.